Okay, so it says uh, permission to record local files. I just clicked on that, so you should be able to record. Okay, pause to stop recording. So it looks like I'm recording too, eh? Yes. Perfect, thank you, mate. Yep, absolutely, let's see here. Now, do you want to do two things at a time? In other words, uh, first, maybe you inter you uh, interview me and then follow that and either stop the recording or whatever and do the next recording? Uh, however you, well, I think that it could probably flow together, no? Yeah, sure, um, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, hello, Kurt Kruger. Uh, welcome to Own Your Space. I'm the host, Jason Johnson. Um, you are the author of Winning Ways for Living, a book that I just finished. Uh, the, the language and the, the, the words, the, your writings, your experiences were so profound, um, so loving. Um, I just had to reach out. You're, you were an athlete, a, a student of life, a teacher, so much more. Um, yeah, so welcome to Own Your Space, Kurt. Thank you. I want to welcome you and everybody else with great respect and love. I think Thank you. when a person stops this sort of crazy energy flow that we usually get into, and we focus on that, then that allows us to be more present. And uh, it's a gift. That's why they call it present. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. It's the present. Um, so I, I believe that all things are connected. I believe uh, that all things are possible. I've always felt that way. And I, I, I believe in a higher power and that higher power is love. And so I wanted, you know, when I listened to your audio book, there were a few things that uh, resonated with me, Kurt, and uh, the power of love, that positive energy, um, energy, healing, meditation, and uh, life happens to us or for us, depending on how you look at it. It's, you know, our mindset. And so, um, you know, you, you're, I, I think from reading your book, I mean, you're on a mission. Ooh. Ever since I was very young, like you. Yes. It's, it's interesting because you, you mentioned so many things that reminds me of a teacher that once taught, quote, God. His name was Vashishta. He happened to be the teacher of a man, a prince named Rama. And Rama, according to many Hindus, is God incarnate, just like Jesus was. And before Rama, who had learned from his teacher how to build a mud hut, live in the jungle, make his bow and arrows, and all the things that he had to do to become a king. He taught him for years, and when he his father and the guru knew that he was ready to come back to take over the kingdom, Rama, before he leaves, asked the best question I've ever, ever heard for a teacher. What is your highest teaching? And the guru just turns to him and he says, the world is as you see it. Now, some people see the sun behind me. It was taken in South Africa. And that sun, for some people, they see it as a sunset. Other people see it as a sunrise. So the world is really as you see it. You see it either with rose-colored glasses like some people in the 60s had on, or you see it as a hellish and the, the, these people are taking over or those people are taking over and all of that separation demon. And it separates us from the essence of life. And that's like you said, love. Yeah, that's, uh, that was very beautiful, Kurt. Um, you're absolutely right. The, the world, life, as we go from moment to moment, every, the answers are in front of us. I mean, we learn from the earth. We learn from uh, the moments that we have. Um, I, I am a big 
guy of, uh, you know, looking at signs in front of me when I see things and what does that mean for me and how do I, you know, it's how we, uh, we can't control what necessarily happens to us, but we can control the moments after that. Oh, totally. That sounds like you're a stoic. I don't know if you know, I, I actually, uh, I get the daily stoic in my mailbox each day. And I used to be one of my majors, I had three at the University of Colorado was history, classics and physical education. They now call it kinesiology. Well, with these classics, I studied Greek and Roman literature and, and history and all the different aspects of life in the classical time period in the West. Then after college, I started to get into the East. And that was where the West found a lot of their knowledge. And if you look at how history moved, that the thoughts moved across the continents, it was just that way. Uh, the depth and, and scientific understanding of the East is very profound. But again, is the essence of all life is that thing, some people will call it harmony. Some people will call it love. Um, Prince Charles, not, um, uh, Prince Charles, no, no, uh, what's his name? It must be, uh, he has a book called Harmony. And it's all about not just science, but also architecture and how it can bring you into harmony. And there's a labyrinth that, that I can actually show you the, something that is very close to my heart. Um, there's a shark's labyrinth, and the shark's labyrinth was designed by the mystics of the Middle Ages. And this is actually the peace labyrinth with a design where you walk in, you can't see the very top, but you'd walk in and you'd follow the path in. And it'd go around and you follow it and so on until you get into the center. And then you retrace your steps out. It's only one path. It's not a, it's not a maze. And when you do that, you feel more peaceful because the designers of it were the mystics in the Middle Ages. And this was a design that they put at the entrance to the Cathedral of Notre Dame in a place called Chartres, France, just outside of Paris, about 40 miles. When you walk it, it makes you feel like you've been to the Holy Land. Now we call it Holy Land for three religions, the Jewish religion, the Christian religion, and the Islamic religion, because it's sacred to both, all three. Nobody could go to the Holy Land, but the very, very, very few people because they didn't have the money, they didn't have the time. But these mystics made that design so that when you went into the atrium, the very beginning of the cathedral, you would walk that path and go into this incredible cathedral. Wow. You would feel like you're ready for what they call mass in the Catholic tradition you would want to be able to experience God because you felt so peaceful. And when you walk out of the church, obviously you feel so much more peaceful and it carries through your day. Uh, it's so magical that I was walking at one time, actually with a Catholic priest this one time over to cemetery, it's called Forest Lawn in Los Angeles. And we had just come out of it and some kids from a, a, a gravesite comes running over haphazardly onto this area. And I said, wait, 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 there's the entrance. If you want to follow the path in, it's going to weave around and you can run or you can hopscotch or you can just do whatever you want to do, but follow that path in and then retrace your steps back out. They actually did it. These young kids, they went over to their family when they got out and brought them back. Wow. Why? It's amazing. There are some things in life, like when you go to a sacred site, there's reason why it's sacred for whatever religion. Imagine going to the 
in the Hajj, where, the, where you go to the Kaaba in Mecca. The energy there is so pure because everybody has been walking so far to get to there. And they're thinking about God only. And that pure harmonious energy is there, is present. You feel it. Like if you ever get a chance to meet somebody like the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh or, or Desmond Tutu, Desmond and Dalai Lama are a gas. I got to hang out with them for a while. My wife actually spoke Zulu to him because she's from South Africa. You know, I mean, just magical life we get to live. We get to explore life. And this is the beauty of it. It's amazing. I sometimes get on tangents, you know, I, I can blab hours and hours because when you're 94,000 years old, you get the few things, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, feel free. Uh, well, it's my comes. turn. I get to ask you a question. Okay. What is it that you seek the most for your life? That's deep. And, um, I'll tell you that something that resonates with me is that people feel uh, to feel worthy, to feel love, to feel that they can overcome whatever is in front of them. I've always found myself um, connected to or drawn to people that have challenges with uh, just having the, uh, a good frame of mind. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what drives me, uh, you know, in my, in my teens, early twenties, um, I spent a lot of time with one-on-one -on -one with people, just kind of talking to them and letting them know that things are going to be okay. And, and they can move forward in life and not have to accept the things that are, but create the things that they want. And, um, you know, I, I lost a little bit of that uh, when I, I got into uh, a job with, in corporate America. Um, I got married, I had children. Uh, so then it was more about responsibility and insurance and providing for my family. And so I, and I was in this new environment that um, I was trying to figure out also, because I, as a young, younger person, uh, being connected with people, and, and I was an artist, I sculpted, I painted. Um, and so, you know, at some point, a friend of mine said, hey, you need a job, because I, I would, I would sell a piece of artwork, and then I would three months would go by, and I wouldn't be working, and I would need to, you know, something. So I got a job that I thought was going to be temporary. And I excelled at it, just because of being present with my customers being present with people and being honest and open and authentic. It really elevated my career in corporate America. It, but, and I still felt, felt out of place with my peers. Like I, I was just, I didn't belong in that corporate realm. It just felt really odd. But finally I made the decision that, you know, I've proven my path. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be me and not try to be that. And my success continued, and and I involved uh, with my the team at, at the office. Uh, uh, you know, own your space started with my team being present with what you can control. Don't worry about what you can't. Uh, let me know, and I'll figure out how to navigate that. But be in own your space with your what, what you can control with your customers, with your product, with your your vehicle, with whatever you're doing throughout your day. Own your space. And so I, and so I just, you know, I've been doing that for several years and then COVID came and it shut our businesses down and it really kind of, I've always been productive, productive and produced and, and, and always creating things in life. And when COVID came and it really just kind of hit us hard and everything just shut down, I felt like. I needed something. And so I started the podcast and I thought, well, you know, let me talk a little bit about leadership and cause I'm, I'm connected more probably in uh, LinkedIn than I am in uh, Instagram, you know? So that's kind of this business world and, 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 and associates 
And so I started doing the podcast, focusing around uh, leadership and stuff. But I, I sprinkled in a little bit of, you know, love and uh, uh, healing and uh, compassion and uh, personal accountability, that sort of thing in there. And so that's been, you know, four, four months now, four to five. And just recently, um, I've just been, you know, being hit with a lot of love uh, in, in the signs and meeting different people and having different conversations. And then I went and, you know, pulled out a journal that I started in August of uh, 1997 that still has some blank pages in it. So I, I've been writing a little bit in my journal, but it's continuous. So I date and write and and, the, and I look back to 1997 and all those things that I'm thinking about now are, are written right there. And it's something that's been with me this whole time. And, and so that's, um, I don't know, did I answer your question, Kurt? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're somewhat of a tangentialist, just like I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so uh, all that passion is in me and I feel like I want to create a space because ultimately what I'd like to do is be one of the catalysts that helps bridge the gap between what we feel at our subconscious level of love and harmony and peace to the conscious level in business and industry and e-commerce and the whole you know, how do we bridge that gap so people operate that way and people think that way? And uh, so more of a, a messenger, yes, if yes. you will. I, I got to be one of those messengers, so to speak, when I designed some programs in stress management. The reason I designed programs in stress management came from my life experience. And, and you read about that in the book. And, and having been on a hijacked airplane, getting into the deepest state of meditation I'd ever been in at the time, uh, and then coming back to uh, inner city school that had people with guns and knives and all kinds of other weapons. And I was always a teacher in the inner city schools. Uh, I started in 1969 and finally retired in uh, 2016. I've taught from middle school to university. Uh, I've brought yoga and meditation into all those areas of my life because it works. I was just on a podcast with with a rotary club in um, Kenya and talking to them about uplifting the people and sharing that they talked to me about they asked me to talk about volunteering and that's what rotaries do and because I've spoken at Delhi Rotary and, and Los Angeles Rotary and so on and when you volunteer, your heart is open, you're giving, you're doing what they call in India, karma yoga, um, selfless service. And automatically you feel good doing it. Yeah. And this is a key. The reason you feel good is because you cannot serve others. You are serving yourself. When you come to this consciousness, you're actually understanding physics. Quantum physics proves it. There's a great documentary called Infinite Potential. David Bohm was the successor to Einstein. He was at that level as Einstein was. This man had a person that he learned a lot from. His name was Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti uh, used to tell people, you don't need a guru. Don't believe in gurus, follow your heart, follow the truth inside you, and so on. And they had great dialogues. It's a great little video. The key factor really for love is know that it's universal. It's in every single religion. The golden rule is in every single religion. When we follow that, we're in heaven. Yeah. Imagine everybody treating others the way you would like to be treated. Now, many people don't treat their own body the way they should. Yeah. They don't fuel it the best way. I'll give you an example about the importance of nutrition. And again, it was brought out in Winning Ways for Living. Mm -hmm. At the Olympic Scientific Congress in 84, where, where I was actually presenting 
meditation and the ultimate performance in sports, I went to the keynote speaker in nutrition. His name was Dr. Michael Colgan from New Zealand. He did a study of athletes when he gave some people a placebo and other people the proper supplements. The ones that had the supplements had up to 50% more endurance and strength than the ones who had the placebo. Yet the placebo effect was there. Placebo effect had great improvements too because they thought they were getting it. That's yeah. the power of the mind. Yeah. Oftentimes people don't think of that, but it is very powerful. Yeah. So he also found that it balances your mood swings, that your IQ can go up up to 20 points higher. Who doesn't want that? Right. But how many of us eat as good a food as we should? Like no GMOs, organic food. Why put pesticides and herbicides? If it's killing plants, what's it doing to your body? And yeah. so on and so forth. You honor that and eating the right amount, eating at the right time. And another key, most people don't even think about it. A lot of people in their religion pray before they eat. They thank God for having given them the food on their plate, which is a very wise thing to do. But if you're not religious, it's also good to pause before you eat. Instead of having your crazy day and you come and sit down and gobble it up, sit down, pay attention to the movement and sound of your breath, focus on what that's going to give you so that you can give something back. I'll give you an interesting point. Trees feed us air, oxygen, right? Yep. They do that. You know why? Because they know you will become their compost. So they're actually helping themselves. We feed cows or plants so we can eat them. But when we eat the right food, we will be thriving. Imagine eating the closest food to life that you can. Cows get big and fat and other animals get big because of them eating plants or this or that. They don't eat other animals usually except for some carnivores. Yeah. And we don't usually eat the carnivores. <laughs> That's another story too, like some of us do. No, not me. Uh, <laughs> And so when we are nourishing us with the closest to the life force, it fuels us with more life force. When we do the same thing with our thoughts, imagine, I see so many people, including my identical twin brother, posting things that are so negative, things that he doesn't want. Yeah. Yeah. He talks about fake news. Yeah. He doesn't want fake news, but he talks all the time about it. Putting out negative forces. How does that make you feel? Immediately, your yeah. energy goes down. I can, I, I can prove this. Like when I was at the Olympic Scientific Congress and actually an Olympic village in, in Korea, I'm working with athletes in sports psychology. And there's a guy that's behind me. He's about six foot five, 250 pounds. Big guy, strong. I said, uh, you look pretty strong. Uh, are you? He says, yeah, I'm pretty strong. I said, what do you do? He says, he's a rower. He was from America, so he could talk easily. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I want you to stick your strong arm out to the side. I'm going to use three fingers and push down on it. I'm going to hold the other shoulder with my other hand so you don't tilt. Okay? I want you to hold and don't let go. And keep it up. I could, I was, I was hanging on his arm. And he says, what are you going to do now? He was strong. I said, okay. I reached over because we're in line for getting food in the commissary. I grabbed a packet of sugar, like you put in coffee. I said, hold this at your thymus. And hold your strong arm outside. And ask, just mentally say, is this good for me? And I'm going to use my three fingers and I'm going to push down. Stay strong. His mouth dropped as fast as his arm. I said, okay. 
I took the, honey, the sugar away and I gave him a packet of honey. Again, like you put in coffee or tea. Holds his arm out. I say, say the same thing. Is this good for me? He stayed strong. I could hang on his arm again. Then I said, tell this person, I am weak, I am weak, but stay strong. His arm went down easily. Then I said, say the opposite. Again, he stayed strong. Then I did something I had never done before. I said, tell me your mother's name or lie to me. He lied twice. I said, you can keep this up, but you've been telling me lies. And the third time he told me his mother's name, he stayed strong. So it's a lie detector test. It's called behavioral kinesiology. You can read a book called Your Body Doesn't Lie by Dr. John Diamond this, explaining that. There's other books on it more recent, but that's an old one from the 80s or so, yeah. you know, when you're 94,000 years old. Or... So any questions? Uh, I've been, oh, I got to get you a question. Yeah. Do you eat the optimum that you should? No. I, um, so my wife and I moved out to the country. Uh, so my commute, I told you earlier that I commute about 16 hours a week. Oof. I'm 65 miles from my office east of Dallas. Um, about four and a half, five years ago, my wife moved out. My wife and I and our two kids moved out to the country because we wanted to create a life for ourselves uh, with a nice garden and chickens so that we can have fresh eggs. And so that's what we do. And so we have a uh, 30 something by 20 foot something garden. And my wife grows all the beets, the onions, the garlic, just pretty much everything. And so we, uh, we, we do consume fresh vegetables from the garden uh, and fresh eggs from our chickens that are happy chickens that oh, roam yeah. around and eat the bugs. Uh, but, you know, we do sometimes uh, go through a drive through and um, or, you know, just so some I would say that I, I eat better more than 50 percent of the time, but not all the time. Uh -huh. So you're honoring your body as best you can. Yeah. And, and uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now, many listeners may not. And there are ways to be able to reverse that propensity because they're old habits. And you read one of the ways, which is called switching in the book. I think it's the second most powerful practice you can do written up in that book. And you found that there's a lot of different practices in it. Yeah. Switching reverses negative habits and it uses a psychosomatic spiritual practice. So it's hitting the three main areas of your life. It, it, it doesn't necessarily touch your emotions so much as it does those primary three. Uh, but it does affect your emotions because you're feeling happier when you're switching it. I started it with a, a boy who used to suck his thumb in school. He was 14 years old. Wow. And I asked him after class, I said, do you want to stop sucking your thumb? He said, yes. I said, okay, every time you start to reach your thumb, I'm going to go like this in class. I'm teaching them physical education. So other students didn't know what I was doing. I'm just moving my arms. Yeah. But he knew, and he'd pull his hand out. And I said, every time I do that, say, I said at that time when I started it, cancel. But now I say switch, because cancel has a negative thought. Yeah. When I was talking about those negativities, yeah, switch gives the energy. Switch is a command versus a negative thought. Well, it's also a positive a, imp, 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 implementation, not implementation, meaning and so on. Yes. Because uh, uh, we always want to use those positive words and, and also pluralistic words because it's not just me. It's we. Because when I get better, because I'm better, you have a better model to follow. And when I talk to kids at school, the, the youngest that I normally taught was 11 year olds. And I would call them viejitos. Now in Spanish, viejito means little old one. And they say, no, you are. I said, wait, man, when you were three years old, 
you looked up at somebody your age and you thought they were old. And they thought, yeah. So life is relative. It's, it's Kruger's theory of relativity. Einstein had his. I got it wrong. <laughs> no? That's great. So, so, so the mind in switching, and I, I'd like to ask you about meditation. Oh, okay. For, because I don't think everybody meditates. And it's, I think it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. So how does the common person start? Where do they start? What does meditation look like? Oh, boy. Well, it, you have to be sitting in the lotus position and you are not moving for an hour and your mind is closed and everything is off. You'd have eyes closed. You don't move. That's what you are thinking that meditation is. Yeah. I could be walking down the streets of Los Angeles, meditating. I was on in meditation with automatic weapons, hand grenades, and plastic explosives. The mind is either your best friend or your worst enemy. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. And I'm asking everybody on your call. Have you ever in school, in a school classroom, ever been taught how to concentrate? Or have you just been told to? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I used to teach teachers in Los Angeles Unified School District a course for professional development called Peak Performance Practices for Sports, excuse me, for Academics and Sports. That was the title. I, I taught one week uh, practice, hold your left hand facing you. Elbows near your side so it's not too far away. You take your right forefinger and you put it at the base of your little finger. And as you breathe in, you move up. As you breathe out, you move down. As you breathe in, up. As you breathe out, down. We're going to go across the fingers and we're going to pay attention to the space between the breath, where the breath merges and where the breath emerges, merges and emerges. That space where the breath is paused is the place where your thoughts come from and go to. And you do this at your rate, not at my rate. So I teach this to the class one week and the next week a teacher comes back and she was a kindergarten teacher. And she comes back and she says, the kids love it. They call it roller coaster fingers. So I got the title roller coaster fingers as it's titled in the book. And this was years ago that I did that. But this practice can also get what they call a mantra or in psychology, they call it a Q word, because it doesn't have to do with any religion. It has to do with the idea of concentrating the mind as well as the breath. When we say hum as you breathe in, and so as you breathe out, hum as you breathe in, and so as you breathe out, when the mind calms down to one chosen thought, the heart rate calms down. When the heart rate calms down, the brain waves calm down. And the breath calms down. It's both. It's like burning a candle at both ends. So this is the easiest way to meditate that I know. Now, hamso in Sanskrit means I am that. So again, it takes that idea of physics into reality because there's nothing that is not energy. And it also takes the idea that people have of God. Why? God has three qualities. Omnipresent, everywhere. There's nothing that you see that is not God. It's also all-powerful and all-knowing. So we tap into that omnipresence by focusing the mind. And God wrote the book of etiquette, right? If you're talking, he ain't going to talk. He's going to wait till you're ready to listen. 
So we get to listen or be available to listen in that kind of state of mind. In, in the scripture of the Christian tradition, it says, be still and know that I am God. Why? Because we're a child of God. We are a child of God. Now, do we ever think that we are that, really speaking? But if you experiment with it, watch out. I don't know if you remember in the book when I was playing beach ball in South Africa. Absolutely. Yeah. Spikes the ball, comes down and blows his knee out. You hear, it's a horrible sound. You hear pop. So in beach volleyball, you drag the person off the court so everybody can play. And because of my training in sports psychology, I guided this man into a visualization practice, calming him down, letting him breathe properly in through the nose and out through the nose because it brings the oxygen to the lower lobes of your lungs where most of the air sacs are. So it helps to help the healing practice and so on. So I'm guiding him through that. And for the first time, I thanked God for having healed him. Just like Jesus thanked the father for having healed him. He never claimed it for him. It's the father. So when we experiment with the teachings of your religion, what can't be done with the grace of God? There's nothing that cannot be done. The only picture you saw in my book is a picture of a man lifting over 7,000 pounds off a standard. He was over 60 years old. Do we need those powers? No, that's bragging rights. You don't need to brag, just yeah. serve others. We get to do this adventure. We get to experiment with life. That's The Peace Lab does that. There's not a single answer to peace right now. Otherwise, we would have had peace 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. There's, all, there's thousands of organizations trying to get peace in the world. There's millions of people teaching like meditation to bring more peace of mind and so on. Yeah. But it isn't happening. Why? We need to have that philosopher's stone. We need to have that, that uh, missing link found. So we haven't explored enough. We haven't researched enough. And we get to do that now. Because when we focus on what we want, we can get it. We focused on going to the moon and back. Where did we go? We went to the moon and back. Why don't we focus on the ultimate? Why don't we focus on how to live the best in this planet for the benefit of everybody? If we don't keep the air clean, what do we breathe? If we don't keep the water clean, what do we have? Yeah. And so on and so forth. If we do not teach people values, living values, first value is what you love most, love. And then that brings peace. And then all the other virtues and values that we want comes from those two things. It's magic. And yeah. why can't we create magic? Because we don't focus on it. We don't think we can. There's never going to be that much peace. There's always going to be violence. Yeah, because you believe it. Yeah. And you That's focus beautiful. on that. You focus on fear. Why? Then you're controlled because you're fearing them and not dealing with us. You're giving fear your energy and your thoughts. Yes. And so it manifests within you because you're feeding it. Yes. Yeah. It's like I've walked down the streets of the, some of the worst places, not only here in America, but in India and other places. And I've been totally peaceful and nobody's ever messed with me. When you were at peace, it's like Mother Teresa was went to Lebanon when it was burning and having all the civil war in Lebanon. And she go, she, there's an orphanage across no man's land. She wants to bring kids out of that orphanage so they can be fed and be taken care of. So she alone starts to walk across this no man's land. Nobody fired a shot when she started. They stopped. Here's this little woman I miss seeing her actually by half an hour in Bombay at the International Transpersonal Psychology Conference because I didn't know she was coming. But she's walking across this field. 
and the sea, there was like a ceasefire. Nobody said anything about it, but they just stopped shooting. And then more people came from, quote, her side to get kids. And they just walked across, brought kids across that area just because of her presence, her love. And because of that love, she had no fear. So how can we do that? We have to practice things like meditation. When we practice meditation daily, it's like you see this nice calm, almost like a lake behind me. That's like we start the day calm and peaceful. Then if somebody cuts you off on the freeway, instead of showing their IQ or yelling when you're upset and you want to run and fight, pump your thymus a few times, stop the overproduction of adrenaline, focus on your breathing, and bless the sucker. You don't know why they're racing and doing what they're doing. They may be bringing their wife to the hospital for birth. They may be doing something else, yeah. but they need the blessings. And when you bless things, how do you feel? We feel better yep. when we do simple, positive things. Always focus on the positive. I'm very didactic. I'm sorry. I've been a teacher all my life, you know? No, no, that's great. It's great. Yeah. It's, you mentioned it a couple of times um, about serve when we serve, it's really, we're being selfish. We're <laughs> serving, we're serving our desires, our needs to fulfill, to be fulfilled. So it's, it's uh, being selfish to be selfless. Now, that's that's a key. One of the things is instead of desires, we are given desires by those who wish to be able to profit from it. Whether it's a desire to be praised, and so a man is going to praise a woman so he can get something from the woman. Yeah, that's all this kind of thing. That's a desire. But when you have only one desire, and that is to know, love, and serve God. Yes. In every thought, word, and deed. This is my prayer every morning. Every yeah. thought, word, and need. Give me the strength, health, wealth, and wisdom to do it. That's all I pray for. It's go to bed, wake up, do the same thing. Morning and night. Sometimes I'll do it during the day, like I'll go up to on a little hike or something. So when we focus on the ultimate, we're more likely to get the ultimate. Yeah. And when we let go and get distracted because of anger, or fear, who is hurt when they're angry? The person being angry. You can look at all the physiology of that person. Their immune system goes down. The adrenal yeah. glands are just shot and so on and so forth. We can name all kinds of things. I'll give you an example again in, in, in what's called biomimicry. We wanna mimic or, or follow the guidelines that mother nature has. So this great biologist, his name is Bruce Lipton, Dr. Bruce Lipton from Stanford University. In the eighties, when I first met him, he was studying stem cells. He put identical stem cells into different environments in Petri dishes. Now, when I say environments, in one Petri dish, there was the cells from a, a liver and another Petri dish, it was for, for this organ or that. And he found that these stem cells became those cells of the environment that they were in. He also found that healthy cells help out cells around them that are not so healthy. Yeah. So there's only one cell that doesn't do that. It's the most feared cell. It only thinks about making itself stronger, bigger, more cancer. Mm. Now I can tip to my head. I was a swimmer, water polo player, a beach ball player, and sort of like a surfer and so on. I was a Southern California boy. I still am a Southern California boy, <laughs> except I don't get out in the sun as much. But that is the result of what I did. Because in those days, we thought it was good for the body to get the sun. Of course, I got too much sun. So yeah. God sits me down and says, you got to 
get this off you. So I get to get cut every once in a while or whatever. Thank God everything's been yeah. taken off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, about the uh, incident on the beach, the volleyball player and the, the knee. And, uh, you know, what that, that did resonate with me. Um, I was in a, a auto accident and I injured my hand. And uh, at the time I had a befriended a uh, massage therapist who was into meditation and Reiki and she had invited me over to dinner. And so I went to her house and we, I picked up the dinner plate and I couldn't even hold it. My hand was in so much pain. And so I used my other hand, I made my dinner and I sat down. We sat in the floor in the living room to eat. And her friend, also a massage therapist says, Hey, let me look at your hand. And so she uh, per performed what Reiki uh, on, on my hand. Yes. And it, and I, so I, she walked me through this meditative relaxation and performed her Reiki. And um, then I was, I didn't even think about it. Moments later, I'm playing with her son on the floor and I'm holding, picking him up and, 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 and she says, oh, it looks like your hand's feeling better. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just so amazed that I'm picking this child up who's 50, 60 pounds. But moments earlier, I couldn't even hold a plate. And it was just so amazing that that sparked my interest in energy and the power of love and love being this energy with inside of us. And then later helped facilitate some similar situations with other people and it was just absolutely amazing you know when two or more are gathered things happen so much better of course you have to have that love focus yeah no i shouldn't say have to you get to have it because you don't have to do anything you choose to do it and when we change our words it has it either gives us more energy or it takes away the energy like I have to do something or I'm working on it or I'm trying. Take those words out of your vocabulary. You are doing it. You may not be doing it every time, yeah. but you're doing it. You are succeeding more and more. It's like, no, it is what? It's next opportunity. I can get accomplish it, you know, and so on and so forth. We just start advancing when we use the power of the word. Yeah. The word was made flesh. And it was made flesh by going off to the moon because we had that focus. But we also make the word flesh in making life abundant or depleted. We've been like, human beings have been like a caterpillar devouring the planet, just doing horrible things. Nature suddenly makes us stop through this pandemic and we can be intentional or imaginal cells is what science calls them. And we can treat this as a blessing rather than a curse. Now, sadly, so many people are dying because of how things were treated and, and so on. We can't bring them back. That's life, as they say. But we can turn life into something better. We get to change to the new paradigm. We can go from having normal corporations to B corporations, B standing for benefit. There's actually a B corporation status in America and elsewhere. And there's, there's a Unilever, I think is one of the ones that's working toward that big, huge corporation, but they're working toward it because it's a benefit for the profits of the corporation the people working in it and around the corporation and the environment. When it benefits all three, it can be a B corporation. So we are actually fueling the environment to provide better food, to be able to provide better air. We have done some regenerative agriculture on our property and I highly regard, recommend you to do that, Jason. Regenerative agriculture allows the soil to become like a sponge when it rains instead of having it wash off the top. Instead of tilling the soil, you don't have to do that. I was at a conference a couple of years ago called Pandopopolis Conference. And Pandopopolis Conference was put on at Claremont Universities. And 
they had people, shamans from around the world. They have religious figures from around the world, scientists from around the world. Uh, people of all different types came there to figure out how to make life better on the planet. And some people from Kansas, I forget where, what university or whatever it was from, but they developed naturally, not unnaturally, but naturally an, a perennial wheat. The size of it was huge because the roots were way down. And again, the soil is fed. It becomes absorbent and you don't have to till the soil. You cut and then it's going to grow back the next year. You don't have to do anything with it like that. Cuts down on the labor. It makes it so that the soil is better. It makes it so the air is more clean and so on. And when we get proper agriculture, there's a group called soil sponge and so on. And, and some people are tree planters. Trees are so, so, so important. I Give Trees is a great organization that has poor people in their countries planting and nourishing the trees until they're saplings. When they're sapling, they can grow themselves. Yeah. Now, when we plant trees and grow trees, I, I, I recommend everybody on their birthday, plant that number of trees that your birthday is. I'm going to have to do 76 next. <laughs> Not have to, I get to do 76. See, I get to coach myself. And as I coach myself, I get better at having other people yeah. learn from that simple. I don't say, oh, darn, I sinned. I made a mistake. That's what sin means, you know. It means a mistake in archery. And that's what it is. It's a mistake. But judge not, lest you be judged. And here's where we get to do that. Don't judge yourself. We get to be able to, thank you, I see that now. It's like yeah. there's a kahuna practice, ho'oponopono. I mean, again. We're, we're, Kurt, we're always practicing every day. And, you know, the, the, the podcast for me, Own Your Space, is not just about the listener. It's about my journey too. And so I just wanted to, you know, document it, uh, invite guests as yourself to come on and let the listener take away what is meant for them. Totally. Yeah. And they will anyway. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's like serving a plate of, of, of hors d'oeuvres. Some people have picked this one, some people have yeah. picked that one. That's why I have a variety of meditation practices in the book. There's a variety of things for your body, mind, spirit, the whole works, emotions too. And when people find that this worked for them, this particular meditation, then they can try something else for maybe nutrition or for something else for, for their emotions and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Give them a potpourri. <laughs> So we're, we're coming up on an hour. Is there anything else that you uh, would like to ask me or talk about? I know this is, I kind of, in, we invited each other today to, yeah. to connect and talk. Um, a, uh, I, I got two things. Um, where can people find you, follow you, reach out to you? So that's the first one. Okay. SuccessSystemsInternational.net. Success it's all, systems. It's all one word. Yeah, it's a plural too. Success systems international, because it's like the systems of your body. Yeah. But this systems of this body is also the system of this body and the system of the cosmic body, so to speak. It's a yeah. complete system. Because if one planet goes off a hundred, let's say a hundred miles off orbit, the entire solar system is dead. Yeah. We're all connected. Yeah. We're all important. Every flower that God creates is different. And yet it's for something special. That's right. That's what everybody is. Yep. Something special. And then uh, before we leave, I do have a question. Another question. Is it a sunset or a sunrise? <laughs> <laughs> I gave you the clue, but I'll ask you a better one. Is the glass half full or half empty? It's 100% full, Kurt. Yes, thank you. But <laughs> tell, I'd ask you, instead of answering that question yes. like that, 
always ask your listeners and ask them to put it in the chat because explain it too. Yeah. So like how far can a dog run into the forest? Or if I have an archaeologist claimed that he found gold coins dated 46 BC, prove that he did or didn't with what you know now. And I, it, well, I can talk on more. I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> I am a tangentialist. <laughs> and I'm sorry that I also didn't give you much of a chance to talk because of my verbo verbosity. No, that's okay. I appreciate you um, giving me your time today uh, or spending your time with me. I'd ask one thing. Yes. I get to actually do a full on interview of you sometime. Okay. I'm interviewing you, not this back and forth and mostly okay. forth. Good. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate it. Let me know. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Kurt. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I love it, Jason. And I and, look forward uh, to being. Be blessed. You too. You are. Blessings abound when you're around. And it's capitalized your. It's that high inner self. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah.